It was, it was probably over that next two or three hours after that aha moment, still sitting there with Sean and, and talking about it. And then kind of having flashbacks to his story and realizing that like, I was looking at his story like, wow, like something's messed up with him. But like realizing like, no, I am him. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think a lot of times we do that, right? Like we see other people's story, like you're listening to my story and you're like, yeah, it's great for him. I don't do social media stuff all the time. Like I don't, I'm not gone 238 nights in a year. Like I live in my territory. I don't have to travel all that much, but there's still some area of your life where this is exactly you. And that's what I really want everybody uh, to understand. Till I'm dead. I hope you're hungry cause it's time for the daily bread. This is of course Tyler and you guys have heard his story of, you know, basically full on trust in Nathan, Joe, and Jeff. And they came and he said, if they were selling rubber bands, I would sell rubber bands. It happened to be insurance, it happened to be the system. And I remember we were actually at Mona Lucia um, it was your first group read that you were doing, and Nathan and I were sitting there in one of the meetings, and he gets a text from you, and he's like, oh my God, Tyler's going in, and we're like, okay, here we go. And then it was like, you know, a couple hours later, another text, you know, I sold however many out of these policies, like, hey, it worked, it worked, and it was like, yes, baby, that's awesome. So just seeing that belief already on the front end from the very beginning, then going out there, putting it, executing it again and again, with a big target on his back, because, he had the challenge of going out there and proving what these guys knew that he believed in could and would happen and going out there and making it happen. And he's continued to do that from the very beginning. Uh, I, I get to have the office right beside him. So I hear all of his sales quotes. I hear all his podcasts. I hear the different interviews that he does. I have literally gotten to see him transform in so many ways over the past few years and of course, you know, side by side in offices, and really most recently in the last several months, um, working with Sean Whitman, the things that he has gone through and, and really dove into with Core 4 and 100% adopted, um, it's incredible. Physically, I mean, just the other day I was like, Tyler, oh my gosh, look at you, look, you look awesome. He's made that change in the power, in his physical, he's done the passion, he's done um, the relationships, he's done all of those things. And I can't think of a better person to introduce and come up here and talk to you more about Core 4 and how it can absolutely transform you, your business, your life, your relationships, your family, every, every aspect of it. Um, so I'm going to bring Tyler on up to, to speak. Thank you. Hi, guys. So we're about to go through a bunch of stuff uh, over the next really two hours because there's going to be a lot of exercise, a lot of partner. Um, interaction and involvement, kind of working through this process of Core 4. But what I wanted to do on the front end is kind of tell my story, tell my Core 4 story, because I believe that's a whole different story, uh, and it's the most relevant, obviously, to the topic. Um, but also kind of set the stage for what you guys are going to go through. And some of you guys went through this at Top Gun. What I would ask of you is those that went through it at Top Gun, so those that itemized out their three things in each of those four areas, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have maybe not 100% followed through on it? Okay. The reason I believe that that happened was accountability. And that's what we have now put in place for everyone and so I'm super excited, that'll be towards the end, but I'm super excited to get into that because I truly believe that is what will make every one of those hands not go up the next time uh, that we meet. And for us to be able to look out and see changes, physical changes, emotional changes, production changes, um, and, and relation, relational uh, changes. And I could not be more excited to introduce that to you and I couldn't be more excited to be a part of that process uh, with you. It's gonna get awkward uh, and uncomfortable uh, over the next hour or two. But what I wanted to go through first is this concept of holding space. And I'm glad, um, I'm glad you mentioned the three inches 
that three inches of water, there's a guy in Greenville who called it puddle love. And I don't know if he came up with the whole idea of the three inches of water or if he just came up with the idea of calling it puddle love, but it's this idea that majority of people live in three inches of water. But we don't realize that you can drown in three inches of water. It's possible to drown in three inches of water. And that's where a lot of us, if not all of us, are, are living. And so what I would ask of you um, for the next couple hours is just to go deep, to go beyond that three inches and to get vulnerable, uh, to be honest. And there's gonna be some partner stuff and just to know that this is a safe place um, when it talks about holding space, there's a couple of things I want to address here in creating an environment where you're holding space for others. Because I think we all here, as we partner up, we're going to have responsibility in doing that. Uh, there's a responsibility that comes along with holding space. And the first is, is love. Now, I'll say with this one, I've become self-aware enough to know now that I don't show love very well. Um, to people like you guys, not like my wife, I show it with my wife, but people like you guys. I, I don't show my love very well, but I love each and every one of you. I don't like a couple of you, um, but I love <laughs> each and every one of you. Um, Can you call them out? <laughs> no, I just, it's just, and, and, and we don't, and, and that's not all the time, it's just sometimes, but I love each and every one of you. Absolutely would do anything for you. But love is the key to, to creating this environment where we can feel safe, right? The second is sit with what is. So when you get in your groups and you're going to share some stuff, when you give your partner and you share some stuff, I just want you to be there. I don't want you to feel like you're the therapist, like, like that you're going to have to change the person or you're there to fix them. You just literally just, you're just there. Non-judgment. It's pretty obvious, creating a safe space, that you're not there to judge, and they should not feel that from you, right? I'm going in wrong order, I just realized, but we're going to the second column. Deep listening. So listen not to hear, but to understand. Like truly try, that's really all that means, is just actually try. Like listen to what people are saying. And be present. And it says with yourself first. I think that's more, most important is that we're all present with ourself. Um, then we can be present for that other person. And then all that other stuff falls into place. So I'll start with just my uh, story. I don't realize how fat my child was. Like when she was so little, like no one told me these things. She was enormous. So, she probably shouldn't have said that. She's beautiful. <laughs> She is. She's, she had no carbs and sugar. Um, so just to tell you guys my story, a lot of you have heard my story, so I'll be brief through that because I really want to get into my core four story. Um, but that's my family. And I had a good growing up, child, life, whatever you call that, youth. Um, and then storms came into my life, like they've come with all of us. You know, he gave those age brackets. We've all got different storms that have occurred and those are inevitable. And, and I'm so grateful for having been through them now um, because they made me who I am today. Um, but some of those were things like a divorce at a very young age, um, very young age. I was like 24, 25, something like that. Um, a really bad termination from a job that kind of led me down a path of not being able to find another one. And then the ones that I could find were ones that were terrible because they were the ones willing to, to hire me after the termination and situation that I was in. And just this two, two and a half year period of, of playing the victim. And I think we talked about it earlier, like self, self pity. Um, oh, this thing happened to me. Oh, this divorce. Oh, this, this affair. Oh, this uh, termination. This, this, all this stuff shouldn't happen. Like everybody just feels sorry for me. That way I can just stay content with my laziness and, and not really do anything with my life. And fortunately, and, and I say fortunately, it's an incredible blessing that Nathan randomly sent me a Facebook message. I was living in Ohio at the time, um, helping a friend launch a business up there. I was only up there for about six months. I was in the process of trying to get back to Greenville, looking for a job uh, in Greenville. And Nathan sent me a random Facebook message. He was like, hey, we're looking for somebody in Ohio. Thought of you. We didn't really even know each other. We knew of each other. 
Um, I still have these messages, it's so funny. Um, and I told him, I'm, I'm actually in the process of trying to move back to Greenville, but cool, would love to connect, uh, hear more about it when I, when I get back to Greenville. Got back to Greenville in a terrible job that I hated. Um, reached back out to him and was like, hey, let's meet up. I want to just find out a little bit more about what you do. Was, that wasn't part of that conversation, really. So we sat down. I think he had a, a rock star energy in his hand, which I was like, man, it's like soulmates here. Uh, <laughs> and we sat down at the office on Pelham. And, <laughs> yeah, right. And, and we talked um, about the business. But I was in Greenville. There wasn't an opportunity in Greenville. Uh, so it wasn't really pitching me or like, you know, really pushing me towards getting involved. It was just more just telling me about it. And honestly, on the front end, I was kind of excited about the marketing and recruiting side. I was like, man, maybe I could help with something like that. Uh, just because of what you guys do and what we do, it's like a marketer's dream, like protecting and serving first responders. Like it's, it's such an incredible thing to be able to even talk about. So time is everything. It wasn't right time. Year goes by. And Matt Hegler, some of you guys remember him, he was getting out of the Navy SEALs, was looking to move back to Greenville, was looking for a job. And so I, I remembered about this career and reached back out to Nathan and was like, hey man, I'd love to meet back up with you and, and talk again. So I came by your house that time. And really over that 12 month period was when things had really accelerated as far as the systems getting refined, success stories of people that were out there doing really well. And as he was talking about at that time, he had a little bit more kind of conviction and pep in his step. And I'm like sitting here, I'm like, man, I'm supposed to be getting a job for my friend, but this sounds really good for me. <laughs> I felt bad about that. So the nearest territory was Georgia and me and Matt were going to go in together. Me and Matt were planning like, we're like, crap, if we're going to have to travel, you know, if I'm going to have to travel all these nights, I'd rather, you know, be with a friend and make, make it a lot more enjoyable. He was moving back to Greenville with a brand new wife, with a brand new baby. She was from Michigan. She didn't want him on the road. She had never been to Greenville. Uh, so it wasn't, again, timing wasn't right for that. So I, I came on board. That's really how, like, it was, it was a Facebook message. And that's how this happened. The first time I met Joseph, the very first words out of his mouth were, how, what's the most money you've ever made in a year? It's the very first words out of his mouth. So I was intimidated by Joseph for, like, I don't know, the first six years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we met, well, I don't think we've even known each other that long. Um, but for, for a period of time, um, until we became super close, like, like brothers, all of us. And Jeff, I went down and shadowed with Jeff the first time. I was like, I want to see what this is like before I really commit and, and go all in on this. And I went down to a prison with Jeff, and Jeff was like hugging correctional officers. And, and the funniest thing happened, this guy sat down, I got to tell you the story, this guy sits down for a one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm just sitting there, I don't know what's going on, I'm just kind of sitting there just observing. This guy sits down, and... Jeff's kind of going through his routine on the one-on-one. -on -one. And he said, uh, what's your age, man? He said, uh, I'm like, I don't know, 23. He's like, cool, cool. He's like, you married? He's like, no. He's like, engaged, anything like that? He's like, well, he's like, actually, my, uh, my girlfriend, uh, she just broke up with me. And Jeff goes, all right, great, great, great. Um, so, <laughs> and I like, just rolled, like just kept rolling. And I was sitting there like, what? <laughs> Did he, and then I look over at the guy, and the guy's like, what? Like, I just said my girlfriend broke up with me. And you could tell he was upset, and Jeff's just like, great, great. And I think he sold him a policy. Um, but that was my first experience uh, with Jeff. So coming into, this, coming into this experience, you guys have all, all heard the story that they like to tell. <laughs> the that they found me in this dark alley just doing bad things with worse people and that they just kind of like pulled up in this AFBA van and were like, hey kid, you want to make money and change your life? Get in. But that's kind of really, really how it happened, not this. Um, but from that day forward... But Tyler, you know what? Yes. Was on, it much better? On, the inside, you, <laughs> on the inside, you were in the alleyway. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, we joke, we joke about it, but yeah. all of us have been in that alleyway emotionally and in a dark place. So, I mean. No, you're exactly right. And, and at that time, like, it was, it was really when I was kind of at my wit's end, you know, kind of that sick and tired of being sick and tired, was looking for an opportunity. And every opportunity I kept getting myself in, again, playing the victim, I wouldn't go all in on. 
so that I would have the excuse for when I quit or when I got terminated. I could tell my friends like, oh, hey, what happened with that job? Ah, didn't work out. Well, it's because I didn't really try. Like I would always have that like excuse like in my back pocket that I could always pull out. And this came about and it was purely like I've said already today, like it was the trust in those guys. Like I just believed them. Didn't really even know them that well, but just there was something about them. It was different, believed them. And so moving on from there, it was just this. It was just go up and just never stop. Like I, I put my head down, went to work, and they were like, hey, you need to go prove this thing out, show people what's possible. I was like, okay, great, let's do it. And it was just kind of off to the races. The reason why this talk particularly is so important when we look at core four is I can see this in a few of you, like you, Brian. I can see this in a few of you that are like, you're, you're here right now, like Dirk. Where's Dirk, Dirk? Like a few of you are, that's, that's you right now. And that's awesome. But when you hear the rest of the story, it's gonna make a whole lot more sense. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday. But, but that was me, that was me. So what happened? Success, made a bunch of money. Um, I mean, when you go from being flat broke, I mean, I had to borrow the money to get started in this business. Legitimately, had to borrow the money to start this, uh, to get started in this business. And I mean, just the conversations with my wife about the fact of having to pay money to start, get started in this business and be commission only. I mean, she was obviously super skeptical as probably all of your spouses or significant others were when you first got involved. Um, to go from being, yeah, yeah, um, to go from being in, in that place, and, and I was depressed and just in a bad place, to making over 300 grand 12 months later, I mean, that's like, like, not even, like, to say it's life-changing is an understatement. It's like everything changed. Um, not that money was the everything that changed, like everything about me had changed because of the other things that were going on uh, at the same time, just the personal development and growth and just being around these guys because um, I would be able to come back on Friday and be in the office and just kind of absorb um, a lot just through osmosis and being around them and bugging them uh, probably a lot. They would like stick me in a conference room like upstairs where, like with this other, other company worked and I would just sit up there sometimes. Um, but that was it. That was it for probably the first two years and it was just like go. I think the second year was like over 450,000 uh, made that year. And this is what it looked like. So this was like, if you consider like the come up. So 2014 didn't really make anything. 2015 over 300, 2016 over 450, 2017, you know, over 600. But here's the interesting thing, the family time. It wasn't all that great here, but it was, it was something. Went down and then just kind of stayed there. Like when I talk about spending 238 nights in a hotel last year, what I usually don't tell people is like, it was the year before and the year before. Like it was the same. Um, and obviously that's not good. So then all the social media stuff started. And for me, having gone through that period of time, like when I, when I met these guys and I got started in the business, I just put my head down and went to work. I had done so many things and failed at so many things. I didn't even want, like, I didn't really even tell anybody what I was doing. Like nobody knew what I was doing. I just kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. It was just working. And I felt like for me that that was important. Like I needed to build, build something. And I didn't even post it like on my personal Facebook page, like even like that I had a new job or anything for like two years. And so then all of this stuff started because I realized that over that first two years, having going from being absolutely broke to the income level that I was at then, that that was unique, that there was something special about that. And I realized that it had been a big mistake not documenting being in that dark place. Like I wish I had footage of when I was like just depressed and out of shape and just like, just in a terrible, terrible mental place, physical place, financial, all that. And had been able to document the whole thing. I also, in the back of my head, though, don't think I would have been able to just because I was so focused. I, I think that would have taken away from it and it wouldn't have been as, as great of a story. That graph wouldn't have been as, as, um, as uh, steep. <clears throat> January 2017 is when all of this stuff started. So I was like, biggest mistake, not documenting. Second bis biggest mistake, not documenting here moving forward. And what I saw on social media was a gap. If you take an individual in the US from 50,000 in income to let's just say 250,000 in income, 
and they want to get on social media and learn something. They want to get motivated. They want to get inspired. Uh, but really, if they want to learn something, who do they go to? There's two people they can go to, two types of people. The first was the multi, multi, multi millionaire who's got this infrastructure built around them, teams built around them. They're flying on jets. They've got these crazy cars. They've got these huge houses. But really, the infrastructure, it's all totally unrelatable. Like you look at the Gary V's, the Grant Cardone's, the Tony Robbins, like all these people, it's just, it's unrelatable to that person. Then you have the second type of person, which was the person on Instagram and Facebook that's faking like they're that. And there was really very few, if any, in between that were telling the real story. I'm sure there were a few, but very few. And so that's the gap that I saw and what I wanted to fill was telling the real story. Like, to be successful takes an insane amount of work. Like you guys know, it's 16, 20 sometimes hours in a day. And it takes time, but it takes intensity and it's not easy and you can't read my book and become a millionaire in six seconds and join my mastermind and make six figures in 12 days. And because that's all you want to see because that's what sells, right? Like th there's a mass population that that's what they want to hear and, and have that belief. And it's just not true. And so I wanted to get out there and document the real story, right? Like, it's hard. I wanted to show the good, bad, and ugly. I did over 400 Facebook Live videos that first year in 2017, last year. And some of them, I'm like, yeah, I crushed it today. And some of them, I was like bawling in my car because I was about to walk into my hotel for the 11th night in a row. You, you maybe saw it, you're nodding your head. Like, and Eric, I think you maybe have seen that one um, at the time, which is crazy because so many of you are here now that were watching those videos then, which is crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, but showing like the real, the real side of it and trying to be as transparent uh, and, and as real as I could be. Um, so all this stuff started like, you know, the Breadwinner podcast, Sales Wolves podcast, and me and Joseph. You know, the Daily Bread vlog when TJ came on um, in January of this year and, and then took it to a completely different level at that point because now he's traveling with me all the time. We're documenting, putting out videos every day and media company and all this stuff. And life just got even crazier. Like, you guys know, like we're working 12, 14, 16 hours a day anyways. And then all of a sudden, like I add just this thing on top of it. So this is like literally like what my brain felt like. So what I'll ask you guys is what, which one of these kind of stand out to you? And I want this to be really like a dialogue, a two-way conversation that we're having here and you guys can participate, but what, what are some of these things that you guys resonate with on a daily basis with what we do? Hustle, especially because you're asking, man, you were all about hustle when I first met you online. Hustle, hustle, yeah. just yeah. do it. Hustle. Retirement. Hustle. Retirement. I'm focused on the future. Retirement. Yeah, where yeah. I, that's where I am. Where am I going? I don't get DMs, so. <laughs> that's where I'm at. Yeah. 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 This is a extreme example, but I love it. Captain over there saying, women and children first. <laughs> He's safe. But the whole oxygen mask analogy, Sean talks about it a lot, but we've all heard it a million times before Sean said it. But we hear it and we say, yeah, put your oxygen mask on first, take care of yourself. Yeah, of, of course. But when you look at your life right now, like, are you doing that? Like, are you doing it? Are you taking care of yourself first? And Sean said it best at uh, Top Gun. He's like, if you don't, everyone dies. Everyone. Not just the kids, not just your, like everybody, everybody dies. Is that important? And so what I realized was, number one, I was addicted to my phone. Like this is a real message. And when I talk about being addicted to my phone, like this is how I would justify. Like this is a message I got like the other night. I just want to say thank you. I've been down on myself for a while and have been contemplating suicide, but your feed popped up on Facebook for me. And for whatever reason I followed, the post you've put has helped me realize there is more to life and I have to pull myself up to reach greatness. Thank you. Like as I, was, I would get those, 
I was slowly dying, but those messages were like a shot of adrenaline. It was like the oxygen, again, that oxygen that I needed to keep trucking. And those messages started coming in more and more and more frequently. And every time I would screenshot them and send them to my wife and she would buy in more and more and more like, yeah, you're gone the next 11 days, but that's great. That guy didn't commit suicide. Like these are legitimate thought processes that I was going through. Being at home and being on my phone on all the time and legitimately like creating content and like responding to messages and responding to DMs, like every one of them. And she'd be like, get off your phone. I'm like, I'm work like this. I'm working. I'm working. Like this is, I'm not just scrolling on Facebook, looking at like pictures of Instagram models or like something like, like I'm, I'm working, like I'm responding. Like it was almost, it became like a burden. Like these people like, like how do I not respond to that? Like immediately, how do, how do I open that up on accident? I try not to open them, <laughs> try as hard as I can not to open them because I hate for them to see it, that it was seen and me not respond if I don't have the time like right then. But like, how do I open that and be like, all right, honey, what's for dinner? I'll get, I'll get to that later. He probably won't commit suicide tonight. Like, le like legitimately. I was completely bought into this concept that Gary Vee, those of you that know Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks about, and there's, there's huge value in it. It's funny to say it's huge value in it. it. There's huge truths in it, but it's all about adding value, adding value, adding value, adding value, adding value, disproportionate value, 5149. I'm always giving more than I'm, more than I'm taking or more than I'm asking. And I had completely bought into that, like completely. And being a salesman, I had sold my wife on that completely. Like she, she was good. Like we weren't in a, we weren't really doing bad. It's easier to not do bad when you're never there. Um, it like came a running joke. Cause like, of course you guys don't fight. Like you have to be there to fight. Uh, we were at an event in Arizona. Um, Erica was there and um, Joe and this guy, um, Dan Clark is like one of the most incredible speakers I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, he was like, yeah, Tyler, he's like, I totally resonated with you. I've been married 38 years. He's like, but I've been with my wife about six weeks. He's like, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, so I, she had completely bought in again, cause she's, she's seeing this stuff too. And this idea of being, being selfless, right? But these were my priorities. Number one, agents, you guys, followers, likes, audience and what those are really not the agents but these other people are strangers they're literally strangers would not do anything for me would not help me if i needed it strangers but that was 1000 percent my number one priority myself second and my wife and daughter at a distant third and this is probably honestly like i wish i could have like they wouldn't let me mess with the proportions on this it's, it was like here and then like the sugar on the food pyramid was like <laughs> myself. And then like the meth was, was like, was like the family, like in the food pyramid. Like, like it was way, way more off than that. That's way too balanced. And, and like, I was, I was so bought, I was so bought into this idea. I, I used to, I, I, there's probably a hundred Facebook lives or Instagram lives or stories or videos that I did. And I would just like flat out, like, make fun of this idea of work-life balance. Like just destroy it. Like there's no such thing as balance. You're an idiot if you want balance. Remember we did a whole podcast? We did a whole podcast on it, yeah. Yeah. We're like, you gotta just hustle and just kill yourself. And that's the key to being happy. Um, but that's like, I was, I was totally, totally bought in on that. And so when I look at these priorities, I'm like, this is my legacy. And, and I was 1000% bought in. Like these are just some thumbnails from our daily vlog that TJ and I do. Like this is my legacy. Like all this video, like the video that TJ is taking right now, like this stuff gets documented and it lives forever. Like it'll always be there. And man, like I used to like, and a lot of it, it's, I can say it right now and I can, I can feel the true parts of it. Like I can feel it in my heart. So I would say things like, Man, Robert, what if you had a hundred videos of your dad traveling and selling and hustling and stuff? Like, wouldn't you love that? Of course you'd love it. And that's what I would like hold on to, right? Like, I would love that to have that of my dad or my grandfather. And so I'm like, this is for my daughter. Like, this is for my 
granddaughter one day, my grandson one day. Like this is the legacy that I'm going to leave behind is just documenting all this stuff. I remember I one time TJ and I were in the car and we were doing something, recording videos while I'm driving, which is another great thing to do. Um, we, I said something like, I travel away for my family, not travel away from my family. Like the second I said it, it just kind of came out and I was like, oh my gosh, I am a genius. <laughs> like that's the most incredible thing I've ever said. Like somebody paint me on a mural and put that across it and put it in every major city. I'm like, that's the smartest thing I've ever said. It's ridiculous. It's the dumbest thing I've ever, 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 ever said. <laughs> and so like, so what I've realized lately, and there's a bunch of really good pictures. This one was recent, recent. And your daughter's got so big time. I know, it's crazy. James got to meet her the other night for the first time. I yeah. Smile. Yeah. I spent more time with my daughter in the last two months than I have in the last two years. Legitimately. And it's not even close. Like it's like like I was saying, like the that pyramid, like it's not even not even close. But this core four stuff for me could not have come at a better time. And I would I would say for all of us, if you actually embody it and really dig into it, it couldn't have come at a better time for you. But what I know, I was so bought in. My wife was fully bought in. And we were doing OK. I was doing OK. But I think I had about another two years, maybe. Maybe two years, maybe a year and a half, maybe two and a half, something like that. But let's just say about two years. In the pace that I was on, I think I would have burned everything to the ground everything. Like the story that Sean shared at Top Gun, gun in his mouth, gave away his business, threw away his marriage. I know for a fact that that would have been me. It wouldn't happen next year, but maybe two years. Had I not had this transition, this really like aha moment. And so what was that aha moment? So Sean came, I was blown away. I had been following Sean on social media for uh, like three years. Uh, I don't know where I saw him first, but I've been following him on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I reached out to him a few times. We had communicated a little bit back and forth, a comment here and there. And then I reached out to him about um, coming to Top Gun and just thought it'd be an awesome thing uh, for us to all go through. And then when the book came out, you know, read the book and all that. But really at Top Gun, like I was blown away. Like I don't know about you guys, like it's just a tray, like it, it blew me away, blew me away. And then the fact that like we recorded, we recorded it and we put it out on, uh, on my daily vlog. And what blew me away even more was watching my wife watch it. Like watching her watch it. I was like, holy crap. Cause she was just like blown away by these concepts. And so things started to kind of change in my mind a little bit. I was still kind of bought into like, just go, 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 go more, more, more. We're starting to implement some, some changes, but I hired him as a coach, um, which never had a coach um, before, other than like sports as a kid, like never paid and hired a coach. Uh, went out there um, with him. He picked me up at nine o'clock in the morning out in Salt Lake, dropped me off at midnight. We spent like 15 hours or whatever that math tells you um, that day. And it was just all about this, that last slide. He's like, why are you doing all this stuff? And I'm like, legacy, legacy. That's what I kept saying. He's like, yeah, but like really, why are you doing it? And just like the things I was saying, like to be able to show my daughter and this and that. And I used to say stuff like, you know, my daughter's gonna be able to put a uh, contact lens in her eye in 20 years when technology is crazy, probably less than that. And she's gonna be able to sit here. And she's gonna be able to experience this, like virtual reality, like sit there and experience this conversation that we're having right now. And that's my legacy and that I'm leaving behind and, and all that. And he's just like, but, but really like, why, why, why? And when you talk about why, like Tom was saying, like it was 11 hours of whys, literally. We would go get breakfast, why, 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 why? Go hang out here, why, 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 why? Go to his office, why, 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 why? Finally, like 11 hours in, I sit on his back deck and he's like, all right, man, I'm gonna go get a drink. I'm gonna leave you for like 20 minutes and I want you to just write kind of what you're thinking, kind of what's going through your, uh, what's, what's going on through your mind. 
right now. And he came, comes back after 20 minutes, and I'd written a couple paragraphs, or a couple just rant, like random sentences. But at the very top of my page, this is what I wrote. What type of legacy am I really leaving if my daughter will have to watch these videos to hear the things I should be telling her in person? And the second I said it, he was like, bingo. He's like, all right, 11 hours. <laughs> He's like, that took a little longer than I thought it would. <laughs> a little longer than I thought it would take. He's like, you're a little stubborn. But I was just that bought in. Like, I was that bought in. But that was it. But that was, that was the reality. Like, of course she's going to have to watch these videos because she's not going to know me if I kept on that, on that pace. My wife's going to have to watch these videos to know what I do every day. <laughs> like, like, you know, like the, our communication was just like, hey, how you doing? How's the baby? Are you alive? Cool. All right. See you later. Um, because I was on the road all the time. I know a lot of you can relate uh, to this. So my priorities instantly, instantly flipped. And it was like almost in that moment. But then a couple hours after that, when we kind of draw it out, this core four, which we're all about to go through, was when I really started to understand this new priority. So Sean says, you know, the king eats first. But it's really just about putting yourself first. Number one priority is you, not anybody else, not your daughter, not your son, not your spouse, not your parents, nobody. You are most important. Wife and daughter, second. And number three was those that actually value my time. Notice I didn't put everybody because everybody doesn't deserve my time. So those that actually value my time. And everything has started to change. Like, in, in very small, like, intriguing ways when I can, I'm like, huh, that was different. But then in huge ways that I'm just like, man, like, life is so different now. And how I view things, how I talk to people, um, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable uh, the difference that it's made for me. And so that one day was, was life-changing. And when I talk about two years from now, having burned everything to the ground, like that day saved me from that, like saved me from intense pain that was coming. Like there's no doubt that it was coming for sure. And the fact that, that this core four, this concept that we're about to go through enabled me to bypass that pain is absolutely incredible. And I want you, and I, I say that because I want you guys to take it that seriously. Like I want you to take it that seriously. Like it may not be that type of pain that's coming your way. It may be a health issue that's coming your way if you don't align your priorities. It may be something within this business, quite frankly. You may not be here in two months as a first responder task force coordinator unless you align your priorities and get to work. It may be a bunch of different things, but it's, it's critical to do this. Hey, Tyler. Yes. Not to interrupt, but it was funny because I was watching your Instagram live when you yeah. And I realized that. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing just to see, because I don't know what you were feeling, but to watch the relief in your voice. Yeah. It was absolutely cool as an outsider walk, looking in, going, holy shit. Yeah. That he was, that and you hadn't even seen a lot of the stuff beforehand. I that was like one of the first things you had seen. I remember because yeah, I remember when you commented. Man, yeah. I had on that because everything you had done, I'd watched everything yeah. before that. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, I was like, who is this guy? It was cool. He's re he's really honest and he, he's just being really transparent. But that night, that was freaking raw. That was yeah. raw. Yeah, and I was in the hotel room that night, like at one o'clock uh, in the morning, and was just talking about this this change and the fact that. And I sat there on Instagram Live and Facebook Live, and I was like, I've been putting all of you talking to anybody that was watching it. I've been putting all you first, myself second, my family third, and no more. I really don't care about you at all, <laughs> honestly. Um, I care about myself and, and my family. But the interesting thing is, when this flips, that's the only way that I could really provide value anyways. Like I was so bent on providing value and didn't realize that I was trying to pour from an empty glass that entire time. Like I had nothing, I, I was, I, I was exhausted. I was killing myself on a daily basis, not sleeping. Just a quick question. Yeah. You know, you're saying, you know, two years down the road, all of this sort of self-destruction, basically. Yeah. Did you, do you think you knew that at this point, or was it when you had that aha moment and really realized that, that you saw it down the road, or did you kind of already see that? It was, it was probably over that next 
two or three hours after that aha moment, still sitting there with Sean and, and talking about it. And then kind of having flashbacks to his story and realizing that like, I was looking at his story like, wow, like something's messed up with him. But like realizing like, no, I am him. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think a lot of times we do that, right? Like we see other people's story, like you're listening to my story and you're like, yeah, that's great for him. I don't do social media stuff all the time. Like I don't, I'm not gone 238 nights in a year. Like I live in my territory. I don't have to travel all that much, but there's still some area of your life where this is exactly you. And that's what I really want everybody uh, to understand. And so I was just living in chaos. I'd never had any structure to my days ever. Ironically, I think that's why I did so well as a coordinator, because it was the first time that I had structure in that if you got to be at a roll call at 5 a.m. and you know there's a sergeant that's going to be there and he's expecting you, you got to show up. And the way we do our schedules created a structure for me. It was just that the only structure I had was based on writing business. That's it. Like when I got home, there was no structure. And there was still no structure like before and after work or in between of like certain things that I wanted to do. And I just lived in chaos. Like I would, every night, every night I would lay in bed and that's usually, like when I talk about answering Facebook messages and DMs, like it's a lot of them and I would answer them all. And I'm like laying in bed two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning and just like, you know, you drop your phone in your face. Have you ever done that? Mm -hmm. And I would just like pass out with my phone in my hand. And then I would wake up and I'd grab it and it was right back to it. And I would wake up every morning in chaos. Like I would wake up and I would feel late. I would feel rushed. I would feel behind. And this is like on a Saturday. And I'm like, late to what? Like I have nothing going on this morning. I'm like rushed for what? Like busy, like there's no reason I should feel this way. I never had like an end of the day, like even like an end of a week, like a Friday night where I just wrote a hundred policies and just turned them in and we had a webinar and webinar's great and got home and hung out. And like at the end of the day, feeling like I was like done, like feel, feel like, I, like I had completed my like task. Like there was no, none of that. Like we're talking about the dissatisfaction, I think, um, with what he was, Tom was talking to, to Dirk about. Like it was just more, 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 more. Like there was, there was never any uh, pause. And so the difference was now putting these routines in place and the structure in place through core four to where everything changed just by being intentional with my time. Like the first things that I do in the morning, I chose what those things were going to do. And it was intentional. And I'm going to go through what some of those things are, but a couple of them I'll mention just real quickly, putting my phone on airplane mode an hour before bed and not taking it off airplane mode until an hour after I wake up. That alone is like an impossibility that it's happened. Um, it doesn't happen every, every day. Like there's times where it's not an hour, it's 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but like it's dramatic, <laughs> the difference, like crazy. Like that never, ever, ever happened. And when I wake up in the morning now, I do uh, meditate for 10 minutes. Uh, and I'll talk a little, about, uh, a little bit about that. But I used to make fun of people that meditated. I made fun of TJ all the time, like that he was like floating around and meditating and stuff. I'm like, I don't even understand. I don't get it. Until I did it, I was like, oh, gotcha. Now I understand why he's done so much. He's done like 75,000 minutes on Headspace, the app. That like, like literally, it's over 75,000, isn't it over 75,000 minutes? Uh, 75,000 minutes? No, no, it's over 15,000 minutes for sure. So. I thought it was like 75. Those ones and sevens, man. It's like 175,000 minutes that he's meditated. <laughs> I don't know how many years that is or months. I'm so bad with numbers. But he's like, it's, cra it's crazy. And so when I started doing that, and then now I um, have a gratitude journal that I write in for 10 minutes every morning right after I meditate. And it's not just like I write the same things every time. It's just like whatever I'm feeling that day. And I write down my core four every single morning right after I do the things that I'm grateful for. And I just write some things that are like on my mind, just stuff I'm going through or stuff that's going on that day, stuff that I want to happen that day, just really whatever. There's, no, there's not a whole lot of structure to it. But again, it's taking that time for me before that chaos starts. And it's been life-changing for me. The ability to simplify your life 
and focus. So like Sean uses that analogy of a shotgun versus a, a rifle. And if you're out trying to shoot a deer with a shotgun, like it's just not gonna work well. But being able to be laser focused with your time and your, and your effort, your energy, but really simplifying. Like I never really had any goals. I had production goals, but like beyond that, like things that I wanted to do, um, but simplifying it into four areas. And I'll be the first to say like si look, dividing your life into four areas is as old as the sun. Like that's, that's not something, that's not a new concept, dividing your life into four areas. A lot of people have done it. I just happened to resonate with the way Sean framed it because I thought it was the most simple and it just hit me when, when I went through it. He's not the only one that does that. There's plenty of people that do that. I just really love how simple this method is uh, for doing it. It allows me to focus on those three things in each of those four areas. And at the end of the day, if I've done that, I'm like, huh, I'm done. And I've never felt that ever before, like ever. And it's liberating to feel that way. It's liberating to be able to take my daughter to school and, and pick her up at 1145 and then go back to the office and you know, all, the, all these things. I'm like, holy cow, like people do this kind of stuff? Like, man, this is, this is awesome. Like I've never been happier in my entire life, but it's because I've simplified everything and been able to, to focus my time. All right, so what I wanna do now is have everybody take a walk because that was a lot of stuff that just came at you. I do have to mention that I'm using this PowerPoint thing and I put in walk to look up stock photos and that's actually me <laughs> that's literally that's me it was, it was a stock photo that i found tj took that photo i'm like what the heck how did that get on yeah i'm like well i guess i'll use that um but yeah is it raining i don't think it is All right, so before we jump into this next section, uh, if you want to raise your hand, anyone, and just kind of... Any thoughts? Any... Yeah. I actually came down, like, came in and just wrote down exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, what's it? Uh, my entire life is chaos, like all areas. I am wasting time daily, but I am happier doing this than I was previously. Um, my family does have more opportunities, but I think chaos is why I feel overwhelmed <clears throat> on the business side. If I can get clear on my goals, what I need to do, everybody will be happier, period, including me. I would say chaos is overwhelming, for sure. Anybody else? I've always, um, always felt that I didn't have the ability to actually disconnect from work. Mm -hmm. Before this, even before I came here, and uh, actually be all in with the kids and whatever else. Like, I'm actually a little nervous about this whole week, this whole next week. I'm on, I'm on a road trip with my kids, and I'm, I'm a little nervous about it because I'm not out doing business. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm fine. I know I've crushed it, and I've done great, and I've worked hard. I deserve it, but it's that letting myself actually be there is, and I want to make sure that I am so that they don't think to themselves and talk amongst them, their little brains that, hmm. what's daddy doing? Why is he on the phone? What, who's he talking to, you know? And I don't, I don't want to do that. And so, I'm nervous about it. Like, if, is it going to be okay when I get back to work if I don't? Which it will. So. Well, I would say that it's my goal at the end of this next hour for it to be the best week of your life. 100%. Well, and that's the funny thing about this core four is we go through this process, the genius of something being simple is that you almost laugh after you learn it. You're like, it's simple to do, but it's even more simple not to do it. And um, yeah, I understand that completely. Who else? You know, when you see somebody that changed, think, wow, man, that person's really changed. Um, yeah, I've been around, as Joe I said, the oldest person in the room. I don't think I am, but. Anyway, um, <laughs> longest tenure, longest tenure is what I try to correct in every time. But, you know, when you see a change in somebody, then you know they actually have changed. They can you say whatever the hell you want to all the time, but until you actually change. And so, Joe, I told this to Joe, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's the best laid intentions. I was going to send all three of you guys notes after Top Gun because Joe has changed. 
you know, from when I first started. And you can only be around someone like Joe was, and I can, Kim, you're a saint, for that intensity that he carried all the time. I mean, I, I sent him a message one time, I was at 3 30 in the morning, and he calls me. I'm like, what the hell, you know? And we talked for an hour that morning. But Joe has changed because of Core 4. And the people in his life, Nathan and Tyler, have also, you don't have to look at Tyler. I asked him today, I said, how much weight have you lost since Broadmoor? He looks incredibly fit. So my point, my takeaway from the walk we just took, for some of you guys who weren't in Top Gun, even us who were that haven't gotten all in, man, I have to tell you, the people who I respect most in our business, you three guys, um, because I've been around you and worked with you guys the most, they, they changed because of this. So I will encourage every one of you guys to embrace this like Tyler has. I haven't. Card carry member if I haven't. But um, you know, as I as I was telling Joe, they have changed. And it's it is very, very profound. And if somebody like Joe can change the level he has, I'm all in for that. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you for sharing. That almost felt a little backhanded. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a complete I did this walk. Um, couple months ago and this was a completely different walk and when and when Tyler says for those of you that were here when Tyler says that you know two years he was going to burn it all to the ground I was actually burning it all to the ground my marriage my relationship everything I was burning it all to the ground all I cared about was work that's it everything else I just I, I didn't have a balance and when I was walking today I was thinking what do you want what do you want and I'm thinking I got what I want because I'm doing this so I have, I have what I want. I have, I just had peace. I had calmness. I had, it was just a walk. I don't ever just take a walk without my mind having all those scrambled words and it. it was just a walk. It was literally just a walk. So I'm telling you, it works. I don't care who you are. What had happened was. <laughs> all right, so let's, uh, let's continue on. Um, I appreciate you guys sharing that. That's awesome. And all those things were powerful it's powerful so in in continuing to share and talking about holding space i think the biggest thing about holding space and it's the biggest thing i've learned lately is that vulnerability is strength and when you're building relationships getting out of that three inches of water a lot of times it takes being vulnerable yourself to then have that person feel comfortable in reciprocating that vulnerability. Uh, and that's ultimately where the, the greatest connections uh, are gonna happen. And I've seen it over the last few, the last few weeks, last couple months, um, I've made some incredible new f friends um, and just relationships. Um, but it was by doing that, it was by being vulnerable myself. And so I'll mention one real quick because it's an interesting story because it pertains to these events. Top Gun, when Tom Shea spoke the first time, what? Yeah, Tom Shea spoke the first time. Was that the one at the embassy? Two, yeah. yeah, two Top Guns ago. Yeah. Uh, when I gave my little talk that day, I, I said that, uh, Erica. I was like, what's the one area in your life that you're pretending isn't a problem? And I was like, hint, whatever you just thought, immediately, like, that's it. And as I was sitting up there on stage saying it, in my head, I was thinking alcohol, 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 alcohol. For me, that was it. But I didn't say anything about it. And I kept drinking for another six, seven, eight months. I can't really remember um, now. And it's just like, I think back to, to that moment. I'm like, talk about hypocritical. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but that was it for me. And so I knew that I wanted to talk about it. And so I, I'd quit drinking um, December 1st of last year and started this vlog. So TJ, you know, we start this vlog together. We're documenting everything. You know, we're going to these events and just the day in and day out, putting out videos five days a week and all this stuff, like the most intrusive documentation of your life you could ever imagine. And I never talked about it, ever. Like I had just quit drinking after a just stellar career of alcohol abuse <laughs> my entire life, this life change and never even mentioned it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And never even mentioned it at all. And so we're we were coming up on the hundredth episode of the vlog 
And I was like, man, we got to do something cool for the 100th episode. Like, what guests can we get to come on? Or what something crazy we could go do? And I was like, no. It was like the day before. I was like, man, I got something I think I want to do. And so we recorded the 100th episode just like the first one where I kind of just walked in. It was actually at Jason's studio here in Greenville. I just walk in, sat down in this chair, just looked at the camera. I was like, hey, over the last 100 episodes, we've had great times and learned all this stuff and done all this cool stuff. And the entire time I've been lying because I had just quit drinking like a few weeks before. I've never even mentioned it. And I apologized and, and just came out with it. The fact that I'd been struggling with alcohol my entire life and that I had finally quit and, and however many months now it's been, eight. Um, but that episode the next day, the next day, the next day, the messages that started pouring in from people. I had one um, guy that that night messaged me and he said, man, I've struggled badly with alcoholism for 17 years. He said, I just happened upon your episode and talked to my wife about it for the first time ever. And then like more messages like this started, started coming in. And I realized that, that this is true. And so when Sean talks about, and I don't know if you guys caught it in one of the, first, the second slide, first one after the uh, initial title, when I said holding space, there was a lighthouse. It t- um, Sean talks about it all the time, being a lighthouse. But I think the key in that is, is obviously shining your light. But how do you do that? Well, it's through vulnerability. It's through transparency. It's, it's the truth. It's just living in truth. Um, and it's really easy to live in truth when it's comfortable, right? Not so easy when it's uncomfortable, but it's kind of like you're either pregnant or you're not, you're not like kind of pregnant, like withholding the truth is the same thing as lying, right? And so there were just areas in my life that I wasn't talking about and it wasn't, but a couple weeks after that, um, this was right after Top Gun when we had gone through the exercises that we went through and we wrote down um, stuff. And I'm on this, po- I'm doing this podcast in my office here. I had this guy from um, the Rise Guys morning show. If you're around this area, it's like the biggest morning show around here on the radio. Um, he had come in and we were talking and the podcast was going terribly. Like it was just really boring and we weren't talking about anything good. Like we had no structure. It was just like, I was like, I don't even know if I can air this. This is terrible. It was just like, we were both like not really into it. And all of a sudden he says, I got a question for you. It's like out of the blue. He like startled me. He's like, I got a question for you. I'm like, okay, all right. Let's answer a question. Guy calls into the uh, station and, and ask uh, for our advice. He said, I cheated on my wife 10 years ago and I've never told a single person about it. My child doesn't know. My wife obviously doesn't know. She was pregnant with my wife at that time. And he's like, and just kind of eats away with me, uh, eats away at me, the guilt. Should I tell her? And he looks at me and he says, what would you do? And like my just heart was just thumping out of my chest because 10 years ago I had cheated on my ex-wife. Never told a single person ever before. The only person I knew was TJ. I I was about to say that's how close we are, but then that would be really weird. (laughs) But he's like the only person that knew. No, we had talked to me. (laughs) Special feature. But as... (laughs) <laughs> it's not the first time. Um, he, TJ was sitting in the room when this happened. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to even look at him because I knew he was probably freaking out because he knew that this, this story. And in that moment, I had a choice. I could have said, I don't know. I don't know what I would say. I'd probably say, like, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, you should tell her. Sure. Or I could have told the truth and actually live in truth. And I was like, man, I was like, I don't even know how you just asked me that question, um, but that's like literally my story. He's, and it caught him really, it made him really uncomfortable because he was like, I'm sorry, but I was like, no, thank you. But he was just like, wait, was it you that called into the radio station? <laughs> I was like, no, it was, it was not me. And, and I told the story. Um, I mean, no one knew, like my current wife didn't know, no one, family. Um, 
And it was painful um, in that moment, but it was like liberating. Like when this idea of like living in truth, it's almost like, I think Gary Vee talks about this like eight mile mentality. Like, you know that last scene of Eight Mile, the movie, where there's that rap battle, and he tells the guy, like, yeah, like, I grew up in a trailer park. Yeah, you guys beat me up. Yeah, you stole my girlfriend. Yeah, this happened. Yeah, I am trash. Yeah, I am. And then he gets done, and he hands the guy the mic, and the guy's like, um, he said everything that that guy had on him. Like, there was no other stuff. Like, he told it all. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, how freeing would that be if you didn't have any secrets? Like, you know, like, you have those... Thoughts just randomly hit me. Those thoughts like, what if I became president? Like, what if I became president? Like, oh my God, the things that I've done. Like, I could, and so you're just like, I can't. Like, I'm definitely like, if they asked me, I'd be like, nope, sorry. Like, too many people know too many things. Um, I don't know why I just thought of that. It's random. If you want to run for president. All right. <laughs> just kidding. But in that moment, so... Literally, like, I, I had already told my wife at that moment because that's what I wrote down at Top Gun on that sheet of paper. It was emotional when he was asking us to write down something we'd never told anybody. Um, and I went home and told my wife because I was honestly, I, I was a different person then. And it wasn't even who I was. It was just something I did. It was a one-time thing, not to make any excuse whatsoever. And I was, like, nervous to tell my current wife because, you know, it's not really stuff you just, like, Hey, and by the way, also, I cheated on my last wife, and so, you know, pretty consistent with things. Um, <laughs> have not been consistent in that area. Um, but I was, like, nervous, and she took it very well. Um, and then this happened. And then stuff got, like, really uncomfortable. Like, my ex-father-in-law called me and told me I had to take the video down. My ex-mother-in-law left me multiple voicemails and text messages and things like that. And I just said, I'm not going to do it. It's my story. And that was extreme, like, it has really um, ruined some relationships with that. Whew. So I still, though, that, that all being said, I feel so good about it. Like, it was just liberating. I'm like, whew, that's one thing off my chest. Holy crap. And so this idea of being a lighthouse and living in truth is built around this right here. If you can't be vulnerable with others, then you don't allow others to be vulnerable with you, and you may basically make a decision on the front end that, hey, we're just gonna live in that three inches. That's all we do. We just, hey, how are you? Cool, awesome, great, cool. See you next AFBA event. And that's it. So again, to kind of create space, and obviously sitting up here, like pour my soul out for you guys, but that's all right. Some of you had already heard this stuff before. I want us to get vulnerable today if you guys will, will do that for me. And we've done this before at Top Gun, but I want you to do it again. Um, in order to kind of, again, hold that space, I'll tell you guys something else. Um, Joseph really loves, it makes his heart beat faster when I do this kind of stuff. The other day I said um, in front of our whole, no, it was at the last boot camp, I said that I recently found out I had a son and I went on and on and Joseph was like freaking out. But then I said, and his name's TJ. And he was like, oh my God, oh my God. He's like, you've been telling them, all these things, he's like, that just freaked, freaked me out. I was sitting there thinking, damn it, this truth thing is taking us too far. <laughs> yeah. like, There's some things you just don't There's need to... There's some shit you need to take to the grave. <laughs> so, for the sake of just being vulnerable, I'll tell you guys something that I struggled with as a kid. And if you laugh, that's fine. I really don't care. I wet the bed till I was like 13. 14. Like, and like, I'm talking about like bat, like, like every other, like every other day, like I've never been able to like spend the night. Oh, that's so, trust me, that's, that's happened multiple times for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, like growing up, like never, never could like spend the night at kids' houses, like, I mean, it's freaking, it's like the worst thing ever. Like literally just like waking up, you're like, are you freaking kidding me? Like I'm in that. I'm like at that point, I'm like, I'm in the sixth grade. I'm like, I'm going to football practice. I got to freaking like put my sheets in the freaking unbelievable. And like I tried like all these like exercises and all these stupid things. My parents, all the nasal sprays and like 
Like my parents making me like, that's probably why I carry a gallon jug to this day because my parents would make me like drink all this. Not, I say make me, they're gonna watch this. They didn't make me, this is trying to help me. But I would like drink like a gallon of water and then you'd have to like time how long it took you to go to the bathroom and then like measure your urine when you went to the bathroom. Like all these crazy things. I'm like, I don't know. Like wearing buzzers, like I had a buzzer that like attached to like my underwear. And like when it went off, it was cause there was like liquid touching it. And like, I am the soundest sleeper on this planet. And it drove my mom crazy because my mom would be like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> cause all she hears from way down, way down the hall in another room, two doors closed is like, Ehh. and I'm just like, just like dark, dark spot just growing. She's like, she's like shaking me. She's like, Tyler, how can you not hear that or feel that? And I'm like, I don't know. I was having a dream that I was swimming and it was it's all good. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not the cool. It's really not cool. Like I'll tell my daughter that maybe, but it's not cool. There's nothing cool about it. Legacy. Yes, it's just my like my yes. <laughs> I haven't even told my wife that. She is going to make so much fun of me, but that's all right. So what I want us to do, and those of you that did this on, uh, at Top Gun, what I'd like you to do is write down something that you've never told anyone, or just something that you've just tucked away for a long time. Like when I, when I wrote that at Top Gun about having cheated on my ex-wife, I literally had tucked it so far away that like, as I was writing it, like I couldn't even remember like, like the actual incident. Like I had completely blocked it completely as though it did not happen. It's crazy. Like your brain can do that. Like I had, I had buried that so deep that I literally was just like, I was in St. Louis and I was really drunk and I don't even really, I don't even really remember anything about it, but it happened. Right. And so whatever that may be, and you can get as vulnerable with this as you want or as not vulnerable as you want, I promise you, you will get out of it what you put into it. Um, at least that's what happened uh, for me. But I want to take like maybe five, seven minutes. We'll put on some awkward massage parlor music again. <laughs> and just, just write on the notes just something. Something that you hadn't told anybody or that you hadn't told many people, something that's vulnerable. Those of you that were here last Top Gun, um, we broke into groups, I think, of three. But did any of you guys share any like deep stuff last time? And I don't want you to share right now. I just want to know if anybody shared like some deep, deep stuff. Anybody? Well, I did. Um, and I've just, I just shared it with you guys. And it was emotional, but it was freaking awesome. Like, I felt so good right afterwards. Like, I was like good and reading it. And I was just like, <laughs> I just started crying. Um, because like, literally, like as I was saying it, I was just like, releasing it's like literally it was just like this release um of what I, I don't really know what you classify that as but it was an incredible feeling um and i was i think nathan and jeff um were on either side of me when i mentioned um when i said it which was cool um i guess what i want us to do now um on the front of your in the front of the booklet it has partners and so, guys, you can choose to do this or not. I still want you to get with your partner. But I'd like for you to share what you wrote with them. If you killed somebody, like I understand, if you don't want to say it, I'm probably talking to Mike Rao. Um, but like literally, like if you just don't, like if you're like, I'm not going to share it, then that's completely fine. Um, but guys, what I can tell you is if you don't share it, you're going to hate yourself tomorrow for not sharing it. Hate yourself is a really aggressive phrase. You're going to regret. Yes, Amanda. Uh, you had mentioned to not have spouses be in the same group. Yeah. If your spouse is here, it says that on the top, but don't go with your spouse. Don't go with your spouse. Actually, it would be perfect for you guys to just flip. Like, girl, girl, guy, guy. Like, yeah, wife swap. Because you don't, it's, it's just for the best. Um, 
But guys, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage if you really, really, really want to get something out of today, just to share it. Now, when I share, when I say share it, I literally mean read what you wrote. Here's what happened to so many people last time. They said they got their booklet. They said, all right, Amanda. So, I mean, basically, like, what I wrote down here was, you know, there were some things back in the day, like, I just wasn't that great of a guy. And, um, let's see, sophomore year, uh, just, like, it was a bad, rough year. And, um, yeah, like, I just feel bad about it. But, like, oh, man, it felt really good. Yeah, Thank you. Sad. Thank you for... And so it happened to so many people. And you heard Sean, and Sean's just like, no, just read what you wrote. Number one, it makes it a whole lot easier. Like, you don't have to paraphrase. Just, just literally just read it. Um, again, if you don't want to, that's great. I promise you'll regret it. For the partner, just hold space. Those things that we went through earlier, you're not, you literally, I don't want you to respond. Like, if something just if it's natural and something like that just happens, like, great. But like, there's no response required. There's no like, one person share, the other person hug them for 12 seconds. The other, you know, like, there's none of that. Like, just literally just sit there and listen. Just listen. There's zero judgment. Because one thing I've realized is those things that I did, at first I said, man, that's just who I used to be. Like, that's, that's who I was back then. Like, I'm a different person now. And Sean corrected me quickly. He's like, that's not who you were. It's just something you did. Like, it's not who you were. It's not who you are, but it's not even who you were. Um, so there's literally zero judgment. This is a safe place. Uh, we're all family here. Um, so we're going to take, uh, I'd say, maybe another five to seven minutes, maybe close to 10, uh, just depending on how the conversation goes. Uh, but give it to your partner and just read what you wrote or stand there really awkwardly and don't. Yeah, just, no, you don't, and, and you don't have to stay by them afterwards. Just go to them right now. A couple raised hands. I don't want you to share your stuff, but I just want you to share kind of how that felt. Anyone? I was just thinking I was going to mention it while we were waiting, but I'll say it now. It, it's it's kind of weird. Like the first time we did this at Top Gun, like it was just so hard. Mm -hmm. It was extremely hard yeah. to open up one and tell this to people that you know you, you know fairly well, but it was still hard. Um, and I wrote something down completely different than I did last time. And this is my first time to meet Erica, so um, <laughs> having that one to a complete stranger in theory, and two, I just read it this time. Like, I didn't feel held back or anything like that. I just, I read it. This is what it is, and that's what it was. And so I felt a lot easier to tell the truth this time. Yeah. Well, that probably means that there's been some growth since yeah. last time, and I'm way better than Sean. Yeah. Did you get that? <laughs> You're way better than Sean. I love the same thing, Tyler. Really? It's much easier. I just, you know, yeah. you know, just, and it's like, okay, this is what it is. It's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Trey. Um, I told Tyler the only other person that knew what I shared with him died last year. And for a long time, I could. Just from hearing it. Yeah, just keep an eye on Tyler. But I told him, I don't know what I felt worse about for that last year feeling relieved that the secret literally died with somebody or what it was. You know, and now voicing it off somebody else that I respect and obviously getting, you know, good non-judgmental feedback, whatever, I'm like, now it really just has to die, but not because Tyler died while well, I could. Uh, it was just, it was like I had to reintroduce it back to my life, yeah. you know, so, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, mine was totally different than the last time. But when I saw the accountability partner with Jill, I was actually scared shitless to share it. Because it's somebody that you know, and I'm like, immediately in my head, I was like, crap, she's gonna judge me, she's gonna think differently of me, of me. you know, all of those things that you go through, every single one of them went through my head. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, we, we can't be in this building, we leave, leave outside. And when I shared it, the, the relief that came over me was amazing, but then, I mean, I wasn't expecting that I was gonna cry, and it was just immediately just, 
Yeah. You know, it is the most liberating thing that I think I've ever felt in my life. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the interesting thing is, like, the real difficult truth is so rare that you come to find that people have more respect of your willingness to release it, and that far trumps the actual weight of what it actually was, like, the fact that you're willing to, like, the, the worse it is, almost, like, the worse it is, the audacity to share it trumps how bad it was like every time like when i got up just now and and shared about um you know my ex-wife like i'm looking around the room at the females in the room like kim and i'm looking at jill and i'm like gosh that makes me really uncomfortable to say this out loud but like it's it's like it's freeing it's liberating um i was telling brian that um in that moment that it was like not this moment but when i shared it on that podcast I felt like in that scene of Green Mile you know when the flies are just like rushing out of his mouth like it's just like holy crap you've been holding some stuff in for so long I'm gonna move a little more quickly man this looks like the most simple question ever right what do you want but holy crap it's it's the most complex um, and probably the most important I don't know about any of you, but like last night, um, I was having trouble coming up with a bucket list item. That's kind of why I made a joke about my dad. Like that wasn't a real one. Um, but I was like, I don't really have a bucket list. And I was kind of thinking in my head, like my bucket list is like my wife's bucket list. And I just, I don't know, I've never really sat down and thought about it. And that's not good. But when you talk about what do you want, we're gonna take a few minutes now and we're gonna write down what we want, but I want you to be clear. I want you to be specific. Like what do you really want? In life, this isn't how many policies you want to sell in the next six months or the next year. This isn't, I want to become this level coordinator. It's not, it's just kind of what do you want? Like, I love when you said about your dad and looking in the mirror, like that's a, that's a real thing that you said. Maybe not about the best side of this, most people think of it. But, but yeah, but that's, but that's, that, that's a powerful thing to, to want in your life. Um, I'll share with you mine because I I had written written it down recently. I put that I want to be a lighthouse. I want to live up to my full potential and be the best husband and father that my family deserves. I want to lead by example. I want to spend all of my time on the things that I want to do, the things that bring me joy. And And I want to be the example of someone who lived life to the fullest and had no regrets on my final day. Like this, like to me that that's fulfillment, that's success. Um, we look at the ultimate failure is success without fulfillment. It's also just like, how frustrating is that to put in all this work and be successful and not be fulfilled? <laughs> it's like, I'd almost rather just not even put in the work and if you're going to be unhappy at the end of it anyways. So what I want you guys to do, we're going to take five minutes on this because it's going to take longer than just today to figure out what you want. I'm still cultivating from last Top Gun and from time with Sean. And this is gonna be something that'll change over time. But just start writing down some things that you want in your life. More time with your kids. I want to, something with your health, fitness, income, whatever it may be. It can be extremely specific, but we'll have about five minutes to go through that. is how are you going to get it? <laughs> um, Sean gives the best example and I just have to use his because it's just I can't think of anything better but he talks about this guy on social media and you know when December comes rolling around and everybody's New Year's resolutions start popping up and it always just cracks me up how it's like December 2nd and they're talking about like start in January I'm like why, why in the world would you start in January start December 2nd we said this guy was like, I'm getting a Lamborghini. I'm buying a Lamborghini this year. I'm getting a Lamborghini. And so Sean commented uh, on the post and he's like, that's awesome, man. That's, that's, that, that's awesome. He had a picture of it. He's like, how are you going to get it? And the guy said, I'm going to hustle like I've never hustled before. I'm just going to hustle and grind. It's like never before. 
So Sean said he was looking through the guy's profile and he said like every other pick was like Gary Vaynerchuk talking about hustle and grind and pictures of him like hustling and all this stuff. And he was like, it looks like you are already hustling. So like what specifically, like daily, like what are you going to do? He said the guy's response was, why you got to be a dick? <laughs> Like, that was, the guy's, that, was, that, that was the guy's response. Because he didn't have a plan. He had no plan. Like, I'm just going to hustle, 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 and somehow get a Lamborghini. Rather than breaking it down to, no, I know I need to get, I need to earn this many dollars for the year to afford that at the end of the year. So this many per quarter, this many per month, this many per day, just like we do kind of reverse engineering with our annual premium to figure out what we need to make each week and make each month and how many people we need to see just like our with our business but how are you going to get it core four i believe makes it super simple one of the big things that i like about core four is that it's 90 days so you're able to level up every 90 days so these are just your goals for 90 days and it's breaking them down into these four areas I'd talked about this concept a while back, but I talked about it very vaguely because I didn't really have a roadmap on the how to make that happen, but this idea of condensing timelines. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to condense timelines. Like, what takes the normal person 10 years, I want it to take me three or four. What takes the normal person three or four, I want to do it in like a year, and so on and so forth. But I still, like, I, I kept saying that, but my own. I don't really have a map to do that. I'm just going to, like, hustle again. Like, I'm just going to hustle and work, work more and be away and make it happen because I'm going to work 20 hours when the average person's working eight. So of course it's going to happen faster. But with core four, it makes it so simple. So we break your life down into four areas. First, power, it's your body. Passion, your relationships. Purpose, your mind. And production, your business. So we'll start with power. So in Sean's book that most all of us have read, he said, fitness is not a luxury, it's a necessity. I like that power is first because with the entire core four, you have to look at it as a table with four legs. If you take away one of them, the second you put any pressure on it, it may fall over, fall with no pressure, quite frankly, but if you put any pressure on it, it's going to fall. If you don't have your health, nothing. So I love that it's first. A couple things I put up here gives you confidence, discipline, longevity. Then like Brian just said, look better naked, which that's what that turns into. And that's not bad. But the thing I like about this is this, this is what carries over. It gives you confidence that carries over into production. It gives you confidence that carries over into your relationships. It gives you discipline that carries over into your mind, right? So the body is so important. Tyler, can I start? Just yeah. one thing I, I just wanted to comment on is in all areas of eliteness with military, sports, so many different areas in life, that is like the number one thing that is either breaks people down and builds them up. It, it's just incredible what the physical when you put your body under that physical demand, how it affects so much of your life. And it's so critical that the most elite of anything we can think of demands it of those individuals. And it's crazy that in business and in life, we just throw that out the window when we start. So it's just, it's awesome. It's also one of the easiest to let slide. Like it's one of the easiest when you're killing it in the other three legs, like when you're killing it on the road in business, I can remember times, I mean, I've been in the worst shape of my life in this business. And I've been in the best shape of my life in this business. And when I was in the worst, like I can remember at the end of the day, like selling a ton of policies. I'm rolling out of a prison. It's like one o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, man, I crushed it today. I'm going to reward myself. I'm going to Wendy's and I'm spending like $21. <laughs> And I'm going to lay on my hotel room bed and I'm going to have a feast and I'm going to hate myself afterwards. But like, literally it was like, like I'm somehow rewarding myself. And then all of a sudden you look up and it's been six months and I'm like, Oh my God, where did this come from? It, it happens so easily. It's so easy to let it slide. And it's so easy because it doesn't happen overnight like that. Like that one Wendy's meal didn't make me fat, 
But over time, as my discipline broke down and those things started happening more and more and more and more, and then you look up and you're like, wow, look what happened. So here's some, some steps in regards to power. Hiring a personal trainer, the reason you're not working out is because you don't have accountability. And your other fat, out of shape friend does not need to be your accountability partner. <laughs> like, I did that one time in college and it didn't work out well. But hiring a personal trainer, it's not even about not having the knowledge. Like I've seen some people that have like gotten out of shape, but they used to work out a bunch, and they, this is really hard for them, really hard. Because I know what to do, I just can't get there to do it. But when I'm there, like I don't need some guy or some girl yelling at me and telling me what to do. It's not about that. It's the fact that they were there waiting for you. That's the most important thing. And you can't push yourself as hard as you really need to be pushed. Like there's that level, like I don't care if you're Nathan. When Nathan and I work out together, I push him a little bit harder than he would have worked out had he been alone. If it was a trainer, it'd be even better. It gives you the ability to go outside of your comfort zone, in that example, in the gym. It also gives you some skin in the game. If you paid for a trainer, I would pay up front. Have some skin in the game, Erica. I can't talk about group briefs and some of the topics that people are going to talk to today, and I'm honored to be here to hear what they have to say. As someone who's been in that game for decades, I've trained thousands of people, thousands, and I've been paid a lot of money to do that. And shifting into this career, I had to let all that go, which I've recently noticed I had my own withdrawal because that was my world and my life. I, those were my friends too. But what I did was I let three <coughs> months go. I sent five people to a trainer, five people somewhere else, and five were good to go. And so I checked back on those five three months later, all of them put on weight. I said, tell you what, we're going to do a Monday accountability. They know if they want a workout to hit me up. They know if they need anything, just I'm a, I'm a text away. So every Monday morning, just tell me your weight, tell me how you're doing. Guess what happened? And they don't have to pay me tens of thousands anymore. They just got to send me a text. I'm not charging them. It's free. So it seems silly. But if you haven't done that yet, you need to go do that. It has nothing to do with <coughs> y'all know what to do in a gym. Go move. Y'all know. Are you doing it? Please go do that. If that's important to you, what he's saying. It seems ridiculous to pay somebody to do what you already know. But do it now. Go get it going. Do your 90 days. And that's not a plug for the fitness industry. It's for, it's for you guys. Please. And it's for you. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Have a plan. We've all heard it. If you don't have a plan, or if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yeah, exactly. But being specific, like coming out of here, like you should have a plan like Monday. Like which gym, what trainer. It's easy to look this stuff up online. Meal prepping. Look up meal prep companies in your area. There's, it's literally like one of the fastest popping up businesses everywhere is meal prep companies, which is awesome. If you want to do it yourself, do it yourself. I did it myself for a long time, and then I realized that my wife and I came to hate Sundays because we were freaking cooking food all day. <laughs> so, so now we buy it. Um, but either way, prepping your meals, like especially you guys that are on the road, it's it's so important. Like, that's the biggest thing that I've realized lately is that they'll tell you 50, 50, 60, 40, whatever. I, for me and my body, it's like 80% diet, 20% the gym. Like, it's just my entire life, I worked out hard enough to be able to eat what I wanted, and it just never worked, ever. Um, now that I've committed to a diet and stuck to it, I've gotten the best results I've ever gotten. But last minute decisions lead to mistakes. That's when that Wendy's drive through happens. When you're driving back to your hotel and you're like, crap, I gotta eat. But all of a sudden it's midnight. <laughs> like, what are you gonna eat at midnight? And you're like, oh, I'll go, to, uh, I'll go to McDonald's and I'll get a grilled chicken sandwich and take the bun off. And then three Big Macs later, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So you have to eliminate all temptation from your life. And that goes into this last one, purge. Get rid of all your bad food. This is a tough one, but get rid of all your fat friends. Like, literally. Like if you're serious about it, like, I mean, I, I look at health, like your, like your actual health, like if you have health issues, I promise that would be the best thing that you ever did. 
And it may be uncomfortable. You don't have to tell them, hey, you're fat. I can't hang out with you anymore. <laughs> but like, just don't call that person anymore. Make up yeah. Wow. And that, sound, that sounds very um, okay. insensitive. But you are the five people that you associate with regularly. And I promise you, if the five closest people to you are just out of shape, not fat, but just out of shape, you're not going to be in the pinnacle of health. It's just the way it is. Hey, Tyler. Yeah. Um, for any of you guys <clears throat> that have been around longer than a minute or two, Zig Ziglar is one of the old school famous uh, motivation guys. And he, he asked people, he says, Will you give somebody a million dollars for one of your arms? Would you give somebody a million dollars? Would you take a million dollars for one of your eyes? You know, you're, you know, you start adding up all the millions of dollars. But if you bought a Lamborghini, would you go down to. Um, Spanks or whatever it is, and put that E80 fuel, fuel in it? No, you put it, whatever that Sphinx, whatever that Spanx. place is. Well, Spanks, whatever it is. Well, would you take E85 and put it in your million dollar or hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini? You got a million dollar body, you're putting shit in it all the time. I mean, literally. I mean, you know, just if you think about that, I mean, every time you put something in your body, you're putting shit in the greatest gift you have. And you know the key to it is, and Tyler will attest to this, like once you've shifted and you do eat right and you decide you're going to have the occasional something, you just feel awful. Terrible. Like, you, you just yeah. put the yeah. bad gasoline in it and it doesn't run cold. right. Yeah. And you don't want it anymore. So you just got to get there. You can make that shift where you literally look at food as fuel for what you're supposed to be doing and not enjoyment. Because that's a lot of us. Like, I enjoy eating terrible stuff. But when you can look at food and make that switch to where I'm looking at this to fuel what I have to do for the next day, it's just, it's a complete different outlook. And this last one sounds silly, but man, it is so freaking important. Get rid of all your loose fitting clothes. Just get rid of them. You know how many 5'11s I have? Like 58 pair. I've got some 40s, I got some 38s, I got some 36s, and now I got some 34s. Exactly, exactly, I've got, like, like literally. And, and there's something, to, like, it's subconscious and it's small, but there is something to be said for having, like, a little bit of, like, looseness in your pants and, like, feeling just fine if it got a little bigger versus having a little tightness and not just getting bigger pants. Like, saying, like, oh, it's tight, I actually should lose weight, not just buy bigger pants. But I would get rid of everything that fits loose, like. <laughs> <laughs> Puberty's gonna set in. This, this today, like, accountability, accountability, accountability. So, like, last night, we're at dinner, and I'm like, crap, I don't want to freaking run five miles tomorrow morning. It's the last thing I was telling Nathan. I'm like, I literally, it's like, I just don't want to do it. I'm like, I cannot stand up here in front of you guys and talk about core four and say that one of my core four items is run five miles every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and someone's going to say, well, what about today? And me be like, well, yeah, not today, but we had training. But I got up this morning at 4.45 and ran five miles in the pitch dark. I got hit in the face by a couple of branches. And, um, and I feel great about it. But it was because of, I had that accountability. Some of you guys may laugh at this, but I post these screenshots. That is a screenshot that I took and posted on Instagram, my Instagram story. People are like, oh, yeah, you didn't go to the gym unless you posted on. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't bad. Like, my goal is always to have the last one be the fast one. Yeah. That rhymed. That's always my goal. And, but... People laugh like, oh, you didn't really work out until you posted on social media or whatever. And they like make fun of that. Like, I do that as an accountability. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. At mile three and then into mile four, I, was, I knew I was going to say that I like to have the last one as the fast one. And I knew I was going to be showing it to you guys. And I knew I was going to be putting it on Instagram. And that's why I ran it faster. That's all in too, man. Yeah. yeah. But like, but it's like, you can say that's a weakness of mine. That's fine. I still did it. So whatever keeps you accountable. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, whatever keeps you accountable, whether it's like having a, like I said, like a friend that lives in another state that you send these back and forth. Like if I run really good, I'll send it to Wendy. Only if I run like really good, <laughs> I will send it to Wendy and Becky. If I run like, that's about the fastest I can run. But um, let's move on to the next one. Passion. Your success and income are directly connected to your relationships. When you look at passion, it's not just your relationship with your spouse. It's your relationship with friends, coworkers, 
everyone. It's interesting that we notice this when things are bad, but have you experienced it when things are great? So your success and income are directly connected to your relationships. Like, have you, have you experienced that? Like when you and your spouse or you and your significant other or you and your daughter or you and your, your brother or you and your mom, like a relationship is like really, really good and you can like feel it overflow into other areas. You're like, man, like I feel like I could take on the world. It's incredible. All this centers around guarding your capacity. And Sean went over this at Top Gun. If you look at this circle as 100%, and that circle equals your joy, your love, your fulfillment, all this, every bad relationship that you have is taking away from that capacity. That cousin that you have beef with, the situation with your mom that you're still dealing with, your whatever with your spouse, like all that stuff just chips away and takes 10%, 15%, 20%, 30%. And then you're operating out of this what's left and it may be that you're operating at like 30 40 50 percent of your capacity because these things are sucking you down i've been there like i've been on the road in georgia when my wife and i were in a horrible fight and i'm texting like nathan and be like man like i don't know what to do and like i promise you those group briefings i didn't give a, i didn't give it my best i promise because i was i was hurting right but on the other side when things are great i'll run into a group briefing and i feel like i'm superman you know well and Heather, I know this because I really raised my hand and I didn't do, I haven't been doing the core four like I should be. But I've noticed when I started, when I came home and I, the main thing that I did was I told myself I was going to work out. I literally started working out, doing it. The pounds started coming off, which is great that people have noticed that since I've been here. But I automatically realized this area got better with core. I was more engaged because I was more comfortable with where I was. And then I saw work getting better, you know? And now that, you know, there's days where, like you said, you take off and the physical stuff isn't there or the, then that's going and that gets worse. And then when me and her aren't good, fuck the jails. Sure. Because my mind is too, involved with why aren't we doing good and I just and it affects it but I also know the backward productive productive days our relationships a little bit better yeah. unproductive days I'm a bear to be around and so it's it's amazing how all four of these like the table if one leg's missing it's all falling apart I mean, kudos to you for saying that like you disregard work if that's the case. A lot of people would just bury themselves in work and make that worse, you know? Yeah, I, I buried myself in trying to fix the yeah. screw up, which makes that a lot worse. And that's the, that's the incredible thing about this is it all overlaps. Yeah. And it's that confidence, things like that. It's work. Relationships are work. They're not easy. Like you said, like you knew if something's bad, I got to work on it. Being aware of that is huge. And Looking at your time as, are you investing time or spending time? Are you spending time with your relationships? Are you investing times in them, uh, time with them? It's just, it's a completely different outlook. So with passion, date your mate. My wife's nickname is Mate. Her name's Maitland, whatever. Um, <laughs> get romantic, like get cheesy with this stuff. Like I've been on so many more, I've been on more dates in the last two months than I've been on in my entire life combined. And it's freaking awesome. Like it's, it's, it's awesome. And like buying flowers and like making like things like special. Like it's not just this, what do you want to eat? Like that's not a date, but that's not a date. Like have stuff planned out, reservations, nice things that you've actually put time into and effort into. They know the difference. And if you haven't been doing this, I would guys tonight, ladies tonight, I would set, cause this isn't just a guy girl thing. Like, I would set the next date night, figure out when that's gonna be. A daily connection, this is huge because when I was on the road working my butt off, I let this slack so much. Like it was literally just like check-ins were just so quick and not, it was so um, surface level. It was so surface level when I was on the road. But FaceTime is huge. You gotta FaceTime your partner, your significant other, your spouse. That's one of the things that I've been doing. I used to FaceTime my kids, and you need to do that. And my kids, my daughter. 
and I would be FaceTiming my spouse to see my daughter. Nothing against my spouse, but I was FaceTiming to see my daughter. Now I, one of my three in my passion is to FaceTime my wife every day. And sometimes that's literally on my way home. Like the other day I was pulling in my driveway. <laughs> but I set reminders in my phone. And that's, I think I say that somewhere here. I set reminders in my phone twice in the day. It says, in case I don't do the first time, it says, FaceTime Aylin. And start that right now. Send something today. Squash the beef. Drama des destroys your capacity. We've all experienced that. So identify those toxic relationships that you have and send them a text and show them some appreciation. Sean talks about all the time what he did with his, with his ex-wife. It was like two and a half years of writing her letters and sending her texts before she ever, ever even acknowledged. And you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for you. It's all about you. Purpose, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. <coughs> Everything that happens in our day-to-day -day world stems from your mind. If you can control your mind, obviously that means you can control everything else. Audit your thoughts, that kind of gets to that whole idea of law of attraction. When you really take grasp of that, you'll start seeing things happen in your life that just blow you away, but they're also like, they make sense at the time. Like that moment on that podcast when that guy asked me that question and put me on the spot. That was not a coincidence. This starts first thing in the morning. That's when we talk about meditating, taking that time for yourself. Love this poem I found. It's called Thinking. It's by Walter Whittle. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win but think you can't, it's almost a cinch you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out in the world we find, success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win the prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. It's huge. It all starts in the minds. Walter Whittle. Um, Wendell, Wen I don't know, it's called thinking. It's Walter, I think, Wendell or something. Headspace, if you haven't downloaded this app, Headspace. Again, like, say what you want about me. I, I post that on Instagram stories. Accountability, Wendy's been doing it, Jason's been doing it. A lot of people have been doing it. Like, yeah, I did my meditation this morning, check. I've had days where I didn't post it on there and people are like, did you meditate this morning? And I hadn't, can't post it if I didn't, didn't do it. Purpose, yes. I, with, with meditation, I had kind of thought, well, I, I meditate because I practice doing heart math, but I would mainly do it when I was doing some athletic stuff. And when I heard you really talk about how it impacted you, where when you didn't do it a couple times and you just grabbed your phone and you did this and you did that, did that, and the next thing you kind of knew, you found yourself already in a little bit of that mental storm, feeling anxious and behind and all that. And what you said connected with me immediately. And I was like, man, I wake up so many mornings like that. And the first thing I do is grab my phone and check in messages and whatever. And there's like five things that need my attention. And I haven't even taken care of like how I'm feeling or anything. And I already feel behind. And then I'm rushing to make my bed and I'm rushing through the shower, I'm rushing to the gym. But if you can take, if you can be disciplined in that five minutes of meditation to, you know, and I purposely now keep my phone in the bathroom so I can't grab it when I first wake up, is take the time to just clear everything. Think about the day or think about nothing just so I can now start fresh, not rushed and I've incorporated my ritual, which is making the bed and grabbing a cup of coffee after I've taken the time to clear everything out. That made the world a difference for me. My whole day now is better because then, and I got from Tom Shea, is to connect with people in your first relationships. Well, if I've grabbed my phone first and I feel rushed, now that first connection with the person that I need to talk to to help me connect, that's rushed. And so they're not feeling connected with me. 
And that for me has been just in the last two weeks, a massive game changer. And it was just by hearing you talk about how good it was when you were doing it. And then when you missed a day or two, how it was like complete chaos. And I was like, man, that's how I'm feeling. Let me get serious with being intentional with before my ass gets out of the bed, let me start fresh. And that's just in this Headspace app, like guys download it. If you don't have an iPhone, you're a terrorist, but um, I don't know. They probably have it for Android, but download it because it's super simple. It's super simple. Like they tell you exactly what to do. They're like, breathe this way. Think about this. Think about this. Put your legs here. Put your arm here. Breathe this way. Now we're done. I'm like, oh, cool. I thought I was going to turn to TJ and get a nose ring and dreads. And like, I literally, like I had anxiety about like, what am like, my ADD is so bad. I'm like, holy, this is going to be torturous. But this is so simple when you go through this. Um, so a couple things. Creating your morning routine, plan the night before. Don't, again, leave it up to last minute decisions. Last minute decisions never work well. Get some freaking sleep. So important. We could talk about that for an hour, but we don't have time. And then just do it anyway. That's all of this goes back to do it anyway. Download Headspace. It's starting your day intentionally. Nathan's like the big thing we talk about with our business, but it works with this. You gotta slow down to speed up. Starting your day intentionally. Learn and grow daily. Read, listen to podcasts, watch YouTube. Utilize social media. Like social media is not the enemy, I promise. No matter what the media wants to tell you, you can absolutely grow as a human being using social media in the right way, following people that are thought leaders and influencers and entrepreneurs and people that are doing incredible things. Production. There is no nobility in being broke. So this is the fourth one. Biggest thing I want everybody to know here, especially here, it's like a given here, but you have everything you need. If I was in another room, I would feel a little bit less comfortable saying that. But everyone here has everything they need when it comes to production. I'm sorry for saying money is freedom here, uh, Tom, Shay, but um, money gives you flexibility. Gives you flexibility. It's your responsibility, nobody else's. We talk about personal responsibility all day long. We don't need to go through that. And this idea of creating balance, I made fun of it for so long, but it really is going all in in all areas, going all in on all four of these areas of core four. The interesting thing about this you can either learn to do these things or you'll end up learning the hard way, like one or the other. So production, finding a mentor or coach, we've got those here, but even looking outside of here, Trey's done that. Avoid pain and mistakes. That's what a mentor or coach allows you to do. I'm so, I will be eternally grateful for Sean for avoiding the pain that was coming a year and a half, two years down the road from now. Eternally grateful. Losing your ego, that's a, that's a whole other day of, of learning. But what I've figured out, and specifically what I've figured out by working with Sean, like you, you see Sean, the video, you saw him on stage at Top Gun, like you're like, there's no one with a bigger ego on the planet. He's actually got the least ego on the planet. But what I found is those that have the least appear to have the most. Those that appear to be selfish may actually be the most selfless ones in the room because they're taking care of themselves. So when he t stands up here and he says, I don't effing care about any of you effing, 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 effing. <laughs> he like really means it, like he doesn't care about you, but he'll do anything for you. And that's kind of that whole selfish, selfish to be selfless. Because when you take care of yourself, then you can take care of others, the oxygen mask. Get clear, what exactly do you want? We're going through that process right now. Be specific, it's the most important question. Personal responsibility means to commit now. Like those, that you, those of you that didn't commit, coming out of uh, Top Gun, it's time to commit now. Now we've put in a process in place, which we'll go through um, for accountability. This idea of it's all your fault, we've, we've been through that uh, a million times, so I'm not gonna rehash that. Uh, but own it, that was the whole Top Gun, take ownership, you gotta own it. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go back to this chart um, or go to the first chart and we're going to put what we want in each of those areas. So power, your body, passion, your relationships, purpose, your mind, and production, your business. What you want in each of those three areas. We're only going to have time to do this once, but I'm going to be sitting down with each and every one of you either this afternoon or tomorrow and I'll help you refine those 
And then let me go ahead and go through this before we start this process. That way going through this can be the last thing that we do. So what we put in place is one week out of every single month, I'm going to be doing a Zoom conference with each of you. And we're going to be going through your core four. It's going to be really easy. I'm going to say, Mike, how was your um, Sunday date night? Because every Sunday you're going on a date night. And if you say, well, you know, this Sunday we had this, that, I'm like, what? It says here, Sunday night's date night. So what happened? And then let's go ahead and get next Sunday squared away so that that doesn't happen again. And it'll be true accountability. I'm going to do it with every single one of you, one week a month. That's all I'm going to do for one week a month is go through these with you. And it's going to be each of these areas, all four. We're going to sit on the Zoom so it's face to face. It's not over the phone. And it'll be accountability. I'm looking forward to going through that process. I hope you are, but I promise you, I'm going to put my absolute everything into it because I've seen what it's done for me and I know what it'll do for you. And it has nothing to do with your production. I could care less if your number of policies sold goes up. I also know that it will, but I don't care. Like it's, it's part, of the, part of the deal. So we're going to take this last, we've got five minutes. Um, we're going to need a little bit more time than that, but I've taken way too much time. Um, you got like 10. 10, so I like take 10 minutes. And again, when I sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, we've got it itemized down the schedule, but this is a continual process. So for the time being, next 10 minutes, just work on this. In each of those four areas, I'll help you clarify them later. Friends. Friends.